All right, welcome to uh, CS 4510, uh, lecture 10. We're technically halfway through the course. Uh, there's 20 lectures, each with two parts. So there's 40 lectures this summer, and we are now, this is now the 19th, 20th? One, something like that. Um, the topic of today's lecture is accountability. So we are, um, so two things about today's lecture as some foreshadowing. First, it's purely a mathematical lecture. It's not going to be anything we've talked about previously. We need to talk about this one mathematical theory so we can use it to prove one theorem. But it takes a whole lecture, two lectures, in fact, to prove this one theorem, to, to, to give the foundation of it. And then proving the theorem takes like five seconds. Um, but we need to talk about it in order to do it. And it's interesting in its own right. Um, second is maybe you've noticed a pattern with the lectures, and it's not really on purpose, but the first half of the lecture, the A, I try to give uh, the what, uh, like the foundation of what are we doing, and then the interesting parts happen in the why. Those are the things that happen in the second half. So in the same sense, maybe we, it shouldn't make sense yet why we're going to talk about what we're talking about, but then in the second half, of course, everything will fall into place. That's where the interesting theorems come in. Um, uh, one more final remark is the topic of today's lectures, accountability, and then the second half is on diagnosis. These exist, these are part of like a senior mathematics undergrad curriculum that you would see this if you've taken a real analysis course or anything like this, but it enters, it's part of the senior mathematic curric mathematics curriculum which has entered um, popular science. So this is a kind of thing that children really love. And uh, there's probably, there's Vsauce videos and there's many, many videos explaining this on the internet with very nice graphics. Uh, not true for other parts of an advanced mathematics degree, but true certainly for today's topic. So um, we need to, what, to, what the point of today is we're going to develop a mathematical theory of the infinite. So when you have a set S, right, when you talk about the size of the set, you use this notation, right? You, you uh, use the two bars, and that means size of the set. We have an understanding of the number of the elements in the set. That's what that means. Um, but what about uh, if we talk about the size of an infinite set? What, is, what does that even mean, necessarily? So um, first off, I want to say that today's, uh, the topic of today also used to be historically controversial because it's not even sure that you're allowed to do this. The natural numbers are, not, are infinite. Obviously, there's infinitely many of them. But the, 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 they're defined through an iterative and infinite process. And some people understand this as something specifically which doesn't terminate. So it makes no sense to say how many of them there are because it's undefined. Um, so the way you construct the natural numbers if you, is you start with 0. And then you repeated, repeatedly reply the function as uh, the successor function, which equals x plus 1. So beginning with 0 and beginning with this function, you apply this. Iteratively, you generate the whole natural numbers. But peop some people argue, and historically now they're gone, uh, it's, a, it's a dead field, that this is a process which never stops. And you can't discuss things like size of the natural. So it doesn't make any sense. George Cantor disagreed. And he says, we're going to, we're going to develop his theory today. We're going to talk about how many naturals there are uh, compared to other things. So when we, wanted to, we want to develop a theory of size of sets, but for infinite sets as well. So what we, what we want to do is extend our intuition about uh, size, about how many sets how many elements are in sets. Um, and there's two, we, we have very, pretty good intuition about this, but there's two intui intuitive facts I want to state out loud. Uh, one is like, uh, if A is a subset of B, uh, then that implies that B has more elements. So the size of B uh, should be greater. That seems in obvious and that seems intuitive. Uh, we're going to come at this problem with the intuition of finite sets and then try and extend it to the infinite. Right? So certainly, if B has more elements than A, then the size of B should be bigger than A. Uh, the second one is, is a carefully worded version of the Archimedean principle. Archi Archimedean property. And it's basically... Uh, the way I've worded this is the whole cannot uh, be greater than the sum of its parts. Again, back to ancient Greek philosophy, these guys were just 
um, saying stuff just to say it really, right? It was the, no one else, they thought no one else had said it before them. So they were really the ones to write down what are pretty obvious statements. The whole cannot be greater than the sum of its parts. Another not totally, in, in terms of today's lecture, not totally useful is that the whole is equal to the sum of its parts. We'll see why that doesn't exactly generalize well to the infinite. But certainly it's true, as stated here, the whole cannot be greater than the sum of its parts. If you take a bunch of things and you combine them, you can't get something bigger. Uh, together, they are as big as they are each other, right? Right, so these are the two, these are two facts about finite sets that I want you to maintain. For finite sets, it's certainly true that the whole is equal, actually, to the sum of its parts. But uh, these two are, are, are things I want to keep in the, in the back of our mind. So we set, um, we say uh, a set S is countable, I'll say countably infinite. If uh, the size of the set is equal to the size of the naturals. Here, uh, size we're going to define as actually cardinality. Cardin uh, a set has cardinality. We use that word uh, to mean both the size in a finite sense and a size in now what we're going to develop in an infinite sense. Um, but how many naturals are there? So we're going to just say that the number of naturals is the number of naturals. That's, we're going to start there, and then we're going to say a set has cardinality the same as the naturals uh, in a definition we'll give in a second. But certainly, there are some sets that appear to have the same cardinality as the naturals, like there appear to be as many of this one type of object as there appear to be naturals. Um, but, and we say the set is countably infinite, and historically it used to be called, I think, denumerably infinite, is if you can quite literally, follow your intuition here, is if you can count the elements, okay? The naturals you can count, 0, 1, 2. It seems infinite in a discrete sense. Uh, that's what the characterization of the infinite part of the naturals is. It seems as if you can iterate over them. Um, and in fact, they are generated, of course, through this infinite process. So that it makes sense that they're, that they're uh, iterable over. You know, um, We say a set S is countable if uh, the size of the set, the cardinality of the set, is less than or equal to uh, the naturals. And here, uh, just to be clear, by naturals, in this lecture, and in most lectures, in every lecture, the naturals contain zero. Right? If they don't contain zero, I'll mention, I'll mention when. But uh, most other courses will not have zero as a natural. This is a course that does have zero as a natural. And I'll explain why um, in a different lecture. So a set is countable. If it has a cardinality less than or equal to the naturals, why? Well, a set is countable uh, if and only if uh, S is finite. Or uh, countably infinite. So sometimes I'll say countable, a set is countable, when I really mean countably infinite, because I don't really care, especially in this class, about the finite case. Certainly, all finite sets are countable. There's three elements in the set. One, two, three. You're done. You finish counting, countable. Um, we're really concerned, again, with the theory of the infinite, so we're going to focus on that. But when I say countable, it could mean finite. But in, I will care mostly about the infinite case. Um, so... Cantor gives this definition of what it means, like how do you show a set is countable? And he uses um, functions, actually. So you recall these definitions? A set is injective, or uh, one to one, if um, f of a equals f of b implies a equals b, right? So uh, a function is injective between two sets. So let's say f goes from a to b. And let's say you have something that looks like this. Um, this is a set that is not injective. Yeah. 
Injectivity, I like to think of it as it preserves kind of uniqueness. If, there's, if the two elements here are distinct, they have to be distinct over here. So it, injectivity, to me, is preserving this uniqueness property. Uh, when you call it injected, that doesn't mean anything. And you can think of it like injecting into it, I, I suppose. Um, but or one to one also makes sense because if they're one and one over here, they should be one and one over here, not two to one or something, right? I like to think of it as, as specifically, especially for today, preserving uh, this uniqueness property. Uh, a function is surjective uh, or uh, onto. I don't know why this is called onto. I can understand why this is called one to one. I don't really know why this is called onto. Uh, basically, if um, for all uh, y in B. Uh, there exists an x and a uh, such that f of x equals y. So again, it's easier for, for of course, f is going to go from a to b. Right? It's easier for me to give an example of a function which is not uh, surjective. So here, this is an example of a function which is not surjective. Why? There exists an element. Um, There exists an element in the codomain which is not mapped. That can't exist. So this makes it exactly not surjective. Everything has to be, everything in B has to have something mapped to it, certainly. Um, there are many examples of, uh, of functions you can come up with. Might not be nice, but certainly would be subject, surjective. We say a function is bijective. If it is uh, injective and surjective. Okay, I've given maybe a few definitions. Any questions so far? Are you... Can you explain one to one again? One to one, it's like if you, this is how you prove it. Like you would prove a function is is uh, injective by saying, okay, well. Choose a, f, a, f of a equals f of b. You do some arithmetic, and then you get that a had to equal b. That's how you prove a function is one to one. Um, but basically, it's supposed to be uniqueness. It's supposed to preserve uniqueness. If two elements are distinct over here, after you perform the map, they're supposed to remain distinct. That's okay. the idea. You can think of injective also like all the lines are like yeah, straight. So it's like two values don't lead to the same value. Exactly. Two values don't lead to the same value. This is a not injective function. Okay. Yeah. A bijection uh, is injective and surjective. That's the definition of a bijection. And of course, rather than think about complicated function definitions, I just like to think about the picture. So if a function is injective and it's surjective, it looks like this, basically. Spaghetti. Okay? That's a bijection. So um, why is this important? Why do we care? Cantor, George Cantor, defines... Uh, uses uh, these properties of functions to, dis to define uh, the cardinality of a set. He says um, S is uh, countably infinite if uh, there exists a bijection from S to the, nat uh, to the naturals. So this is just a definition, but why is it a good definition? Why does it follow our own intuition? Certainly, let's begin with the fact that you can count the naturals. Okay, 0, 1, 2, 3. Let's not argue about that. You can count the naturals. If some other set, he wants to argue that you can, just beginning with the fact that you can count the naturals, this is a definition of you intuitively being able to count this other set. If there exists a bijection from S to the naturals, then you can certainly count S, the elements of S, the same way as you could count the naturals. By counting uh, whatever, you would, whatever the bijection was, you follow through the bijection, and that uh, lets you count the elements of S. Um, so S, in some sense, has the exact same size, same cardinality as the naturals, if there exists a bijection between them. Bijection preserves the same sizeness property. Uh, the Cardinal, it preserves the cardinality of sets. Two sets have the same cardinality if there exists a bijection between them. By the way, every uh, bijection, the inverse of a bijection is also a bijection, right? So you could do this, you could do this just as well, no problem. 
screen, right? I mean, maybe it might be slightly harder to find, like, but you could flip the spaghetti around so you get the same thing. This is Cantor's definition of what it means for a set to be countably infinite. So it's countably infinite if there exists a bijection uh, from that set to the naturals. So let me, of course, uh, definitions are one thing. Let's go through some examples. So let's talk about those other naturals that you might have seen in other courses. I'm going to use the naturals, and I'm going to put a subscript of greater than or equal to 1 to mean the naturals containing uh, 1, 2, 3. So it's basically the, the, no, the naturals I use with the element removed, right? So this is just what? Naturals without 0, right? So uh, I claim, so intuitively, this set should be, first off, this set is infinite, certainly. There are as many uh, naturals greater than one as there are naturals. It would appear first that there, there might be less, right? Because you can say, you can say uh, the natural is greater than or equal to one certainly is a subset of the naturals, right? Every natural greater than one is itself a natural. So it, appear, it appears that there's less of them. However, we have an infinite set, and then we have an infinite size subset. S but it turns out that that subset has the same cardinality as the original set. So what is a bijection? Uh, find me a bijection from the naturals uh, to the naturals greater than one. Give it a second to as a warm up. What is a bijection between the naturals and the naturals greater than one? Can't you just like shift them over by one? So it's like a zero maps to one. What is that function? X plus one. Yeah. So the f of x is equal to x plus one. I will leave you to prove that is a bijection. Uh, it's injective and surjective. Obviously, it is. Right. Uh, this takes on zero. This takes on one. This takes on one. This takes on two. Another thing I can do the spaghetti diagram. 0, 1, 2, a 1, 2, 3. Right, obviously bijective. Maybe work out the proof if you want to fill in your own details. But uh, So what this means, though, is that the, the naturals less than 1 have the same size as the naturals. So an infinite subset of a countably infinite set is also going to be countably infinite, turns out. Um, subsets of countable sets are countable. This is uh, the first uh, takeaway of this. Infinite subsets of countable Ah, well, sets. I'm using the word countable instead of countably infinite. So a finite subset of a countably infinite set, every finite subset is, every finite set is countable. So I don't have to, that's why I'm being lazy and not distinguishing between, sometimes between countable infinite, countably infinite and countable when I just, when I really mean countably infinite, okay. because the finite case. So all finite different. sets are countable. Absolutely. Okay. Why? You can count them. One, two, three, so on, right? So subsets of countable sets are countable. This holds, um, uh, this holds that uh, even if the, if they were both finite, right? If a subset, finite sets of a subsets of a finite set are finite, right? It's like uncountable. When? We'll talk about that after the break. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, we have to we have to I'm, I'm rigorously do this theory, and then we'll talk about uh, the other parts. Um, a second thing is is to notice this. So even though that the set of naturals greater than one is actually, it's not even just a subset. It's actually straight up a strict subset, right? So in some sense, this, you have an infinite subset, and it's a strict infinite subset, but it's, it's a part. It's not uh, the whole thing. However, this does not imply uh, that the natural is greater than 1 is a... Um, Strict subset, so I'll just put it without that, of the naturals. The cardinality of the naturals greater than 1 is not a strict subset of the cardinality. It's not a strict, 
is not strictly less than the cardinality of the naturals, even though it's a strict subset. So first, here's the first thing breaking with our intuition of finite sets. We said the Archimedean property, I worded it as the whole cannot be greater than the sum of its parts. Another way that uh, this violates our intuition from finite sets is that the part is not necessarily less than the whole. You can have a part of something in infinite sets. A part of something can be the same size as the whole. It doesn't make any sense in the intuitive sense because you have a whole pie or whole pizza. You take one slice. Certainly, you know, the slice of pizza is less than the whole pizza, obviously. Here, I've taken a slice of the pizza and the same size as the whole pizza. You can do things like this with, infinite, with, uh, with the infinite. infinite. Certainly. So, uh, yes? Wait, so you're just saying a proper subset does not imply that the size is smaller. The Correct. The reality is not For smaller. infinite. This violates our intuition that we're trying to bring. We're trying to generalize our intuition from finite sets. And it turns out that this is the first step we failed on. Okay. What about the evens? Um, so I'm going to define 2 uh, and to be the even numbers. So 0 is even, 2, 4. So this first part, we've proved that if, if you take a, a countably infinite set and you remove finitely many elements, it turns out it's still countably infinite. Here is definitely, you take out infinitely many elements. You took out all the odd elements. Is this still countably infinite? f of x equals x divided by 2. Um, so let's do the bijection the other way. Oh, not bad. That actually, it's a, it works a bijection, so that's fine. That works just fine. So what if you do f of x equals 2x? Perfect. OK. OK. Certainly, it's going to map the same, same here, right? It's going to go, um, this, this will map. Um, uh, the naturals to the even naturals, right? So we've actually, the reason I wanted to stress, I want to stress it doing this way is because we're not mapping a subset to the whole set in the sense that we're growing it. We're mapping the whole set to the part of itself, which appears to be shrinking, but we're shrinking it in a way that still preserves everything. Certainly, this is bijective for the same reason this is bijective. I mean, uh, it has the, it has on, it's onto and it's, uh, it's one to one. So certainly it's a bijection. Um, so what this means is that there are as many even numbers as there are natural numbers. Makes sense. And again, same comments about you know, a, a part being the same size as, as the whole. Um, now, here's a, slightly, here's a slightly difficult one. I'm talking about the integers. So the, this set is not well ordered. There is not a least element. Uh, is this set uh, countably infinite? Like all the even numbers were all like the negative numbers, and then all the odd numbers were like all the positive numbers. Ah, so here this is the reason I want to demonstrate this example. S another way to think about countability is you can easily find a bijection if you can just think about and reason about a way to order the numbers in a set. Uh, you can, if you can, it's not correct to say sort, sort the set, but if you can think about the set being sorted in a way that you know the next element and is unique and all the elements appear in the ordering, that itself is a bijection. So you, what, if I understood what you were saying, you were saying do all the positives first and then do all the negatives. The problem with something like that is that you will never finish enumerating the positives and then get to the negatives. Oh, so like you just need a function, right? So I was yes. Like so like negative one would map to two, and then like one would map to one before that, and then like two would map to three. So it'd be like. Wait. So this is also troubling to find the function. So I'm going to give you the picture. Here's the here's the natural here's the integer line, zero, one, two, negative one, negative two. Make sure I got this exact. So I said that if you go, if you try to list the positives first and then try to go list the negatives, you'll run out. The, what you're going to do is dovetail it. So you're going to go 0 is going to go to 1. And then instead of going to 2, you're actually going to go to negative 1. And then from negative 1, you're going to go to 2. 
2, you're going to go to negative 2, and so on. That is certainly a way to order the numbers. It's going to be what? It's going to be uh, 0, uh, 1, negative 1, uh, 2, negative 2, so on, right? So if you list the, if you list the integers that way, it doesn't appear that there's a least element, because you take the natural ordering of the integers. Certainly, there's no least negative number. But if you order it this way, then the least or the first element, can't really say least, the first element is going to be 0. So certainly, this seems to have the same cardinality as the naturals, because you can count them. So it appears to uh, be the naturals. So this uh, is the bijection. Is it, on t is it surjective? Uh, every number is hit. There's not a skipped number. I want to be explicit about this one compared to the other ones. It's surjective because no element is missed. Okay? Every, certainly, you should believe every um, integer appears somewhere in this, eventually. Is it injective? Yeah. I mean, in the ordering, no number appears twice. So the uniqueness is preserved. The ont it's onto. Perfect. If I want to actually give you what the function is, like it may not be suitable for you to think about the line. The, the function itself is this. f of n. Uh, it's like minus n over 2 if n is even. And uh, n plus 1 over 2 if n is odd. So that's what the actual, it's nice to do this little spiral swirly picture, but that's the actual what the bijection is, right? You basically dovetail the two things together like a zipper. You take the negatives and the positives, and then you stick them together like that. And you end up with your bijection. So this, this is the function that alternates between those two. Okay. Professor, you could write like the integers as like the sum of two countable sets, right? Is that like important to know? A union of two countable sets. Yeah. So we'll prove that. Oh, so later like, today. Okay. So just come back to that in twenty minutes. Sorry. Okay. So um, the next example, and just to increase the difficulty of the examples, is the rationals. And I am going to define the rationals to be uh, pairs A over B. Uh, such that, um, make sure if I, I think I explicitly defined zero not to be uh, rational. Yes. Right. Just to make things slightly simpler. So the rationals are a very different class of objects than the other ones. The other ones appear always immediately to be uh, just kind of slight vari variations of the naturals. We did uh, the naturals greater than 1, we did the evens, and then we did the integers. Those all appear to be kind of like the naturals. They seem to have the same characteristics of the naturals. The rationals are a very, very, very different class of numbers. Um, what they, the reason they're different is that they have a, a property called density. So um, the naturals are not dense. What that means is like uh, we say S is dense if for all uh, uh, A comma B in S that there exists uh, some C such that um, A is less than uh, C, which is less than B. So like. In between any two elements of the set, there exists a middle element. There exists an element between any two elements, right? The integers are not dense, right? So the integers are not dense. Excuse me, the naturals, integers too. But they're not dense, right? Because the, there does not exist uh, something between 0 and 1, right? There is no natural between 0 and 1. But uh, the, 
the rationals are dense. Um, why? What is, what is give, give me any two rationals, let's say A over B, less than a C over D. There is, a na there is a rational between any two rationals. What is a rational between two rationals? Would be A over B plus C over D divided by two? Yeah, so like the average. I think that's it if I work it out. I think it would be like A over B plus C over D minus A over B plus two, divided by two. All right, so you take this one, and then you add the half, the distance between these two, which would be the halfway. Hmm. So I, do I have to work it out? It's A over B plus. So, that's, so if this was like a number line, A over B gets you to here. We want to go halfway between these two. So we're going to do 1 half of C over D minus A over B. That is the average of the two rationals, right? That's the midpoint between those. Um, don't want to work that out anymore, but you could believe if I did that would give me a rational number. And by, again, by rational, every rational number has a description as, as a pair of numbers. Uh, there's an upper and a lower. For our case, it's suppose they're not zero. And just for the sake of it, suppose we're ignoring uniques. So there are not, uh, you know, two over three is the same as four over six, uh, but those are not distinct rational numbers. Those are the same rational numbers. Just, there's more than, one, one, more than one way to represent the no number, but we're concerned with the quantity. Um, the rationals are dense. So there does exist whatever that thing is. That thing exists here, right? Um, but if you notice that the property of density is itself recursive, so if you have, uh, if there exists a middle element between any two elements, then take these two, and there exists a middle element between those two. So like, let's say this was a rational and this was a rational. Well, OK, I claim now this is a rational. OK, well, if these two are rationals, by the density property, then this has to be irrational. If these two are rational, by the density property, this has to be irrational. By this, this is a this is irrational. This is irrational. This is irrational. This is irrational. See what I'm doing? That's why we call it dense. It appears to be dense on the line. It looks dense. You run out of space, you just draw dots. You might as well draw a thick, solid line. It appears to come off as dense. And it appears like uh, between any two rationals, there exists uh, countably infinitely many rationals. Countably infinite the many more rationals. So that seems like a lot more rationals. If between any two elements, you have countably infinitely more elements. And I'm, I haven't proved that there's countably infinitely more between them, but suppose there are. Um, it makes them look very different. It appears, at least to our intuition, there is, that there is infinitely more rational numbers than there are uh, naturals. They seem not just for, forget the fact that the naturals, of course, are a subset of uh, the rationals. Every natural number is, of course, a rational number. Just choose the b equals one. Choose the denominator to be one, and then you have a you have an injection from the naturals to the rationals. So certainly, uh, we we can agree that the naturals um, appear smaller, or the rationals appear bigger to have larger cardinality than naturals. But it turns out, even though they even with this density property, the naturals are themselves countably infinite. There are only countably many rationals. And now that is not obvious to see. And I, I, I wouldn't expect anyone to get this projection without seeing it. We use this. This is a classic trick uh, called dove. I think it's called dovetailing to make sure there's more than one thing called dovetailing. I don't think anybody calls it this anymore. Um, what you do, though, is you're going to first you're going to list the rationals into a table. Um, so let's suppose we were doing the uh, denominators this way, and then we did the numerators this way. And you put what here? 2 over 2, 3 over 2, 4 over 2, 2 over 3, 3 over 3, 4 over 3. Uh, 
2 over 4, 3 over 4, 2 over 4, right? Something like this. You could imagine putting each rational in a 2 by 2 grid. Okay. Um, we're going to do the same trick we did for the, for the integers, where we're going to try and list them in an order. Um, if you go row by row or column by column, you run into the same problem as you do when, you try and, when we dovetailed uh, the integers. So if you try and list the denominators first, you're, there's infinitely big denominators that way before you get to the next row. Um, the trick is, uh, does anyone know it? Do you know like diagonally? Yes, we're going to compose the, I'm going to call them anti-diagonals. A skipping repeats. What does that mean? Well, I'm going to go like this. That is the way we're going to enumerate all of the uh, rational numbers. Right? So first off, why is this surjective? So surjective, of course, means there's nothing that's missed in the map. Um, what that would be analogous to is that there does, uh, the, this would not be surjective if there was an element that was missed. Okay? But uh, it is surjective because every element, first off, let's suppose, let's agree that every element appears in this ordering. Every rational appears in this ordering. Why? Suppose one was skipped. Well, then you could name every element that came before it, and then you would know that that one's the one that comes next. It might be difficult to actually write this out as a function, okay? But you can believe that because you can, uh, the, uh, you know what elements come before each one. You could work it out if you had to. Uh, it's certainly surjective. Why is it injective? Because we skip repetitions, no number appears twice. We just continue in the, in the, in the thing. We, we just say, we just don't write it down. So like 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 1 half, 1 half goes to 1 third, goes to 2 over 2. So we would like not count this one. We would just go to 3. Does that make sense? Because we already counted 2 over 2 as 1 over 1. Over one. So we would skip this one. Um, because we skip repetition, every rational number has to appear uh, so first off, every rational number appears in this table because every rational number has a representation. So every rational number appears in this table. Our sort of line snaking diagram does cover every, the whole table. So it does hit every rational number, right? And it hits it uniquely. So injective, sort of. Maybe the, in, the intuition here is, is more important than the formal, the, the rigor. But this is certainly is a, is a way to do it. Question? So this would be written like as a countably infinite union of countably infinite sets. Right? I wouldn't call it a union. I would call it a way to order the set. We'll talk about unions later, but I would call this a way to order the set in a way. Uh, recall, a set is countably infinite intuitively if you can count it. Right. This is a way to order the set that kind of gets around the density property. We could get to skip the density part and just order things this way. If we order them this way, Okay. We've gone around the fact that it doesn't matter that they're this. If you try to order them on the on the line, it doesn't appear that there's a way to do it because there is not. It's not obvious what the next. Um, that was. Yes, exactly. Right. There doesn't appear to be like when you count. If there is no next number to do, it makes it difficult. So you have to count them this way. This is the trick to count them. Right. That's why it's uh, rational. There do exist. Um, actually, I'll give you another proof immediately. Can do it here. Consider the function like um, f of a over b uh, is equal to like 2 to the a, 3 to the b. Okay? Oh, oh. Yeah. This is certainly it's surjective. Actually, it's bijective. To um, the set what? It's to s is equal to uh, 2i, 3j, um, 
i comma j are in the naturals greater than one. Mm -hmm. um, S here is a subset of the naturals. So F is a bijection to a subset of the naturals. So S is countable. S is countably infinite because its subsets of countable sets are countable. So bijective to a countably infinite set means it's, ca it's countably infinite. So the rationals have to be countably infinite. So your bijective to a subset of a countable set. This is a trick we're going to actually use more often. If every set may not, every function may not be surject, it may not be bijective, but it's going to be by, if it's not surjective, fine. It may be bijective to its image, right? If the function is injective, then it's certainly bijective to its own image, right? You know, you recall the definition of an image of a function? If you have something like this, and it maps to something small, right, injectively, uh, this is the image of the function. It certainly, it, it, may, it may not be, in, it may not be surjective, but it's certainly surjective to its image by definition, right? That's, this, this, the image is the defined as the things it does map to. So certainly it has to be in surjective to that. So we get the fact that this is bijective, not to the naturals, but a subset of the naturals. Turns out because subsets of the naturals are, countably in, are countable as well, we get it for free. So this is also a, a, as good of a proof as, as we I could have that one. Um, another remark we could make here is that this is, um, because we've, we have a, uh, a surjection excuse me, an injection into the naturals, but it's not surjective. We get the fact that it's injective, but not surjective. So we could just conclude here that the size of the rationals is less than, uh, excuse me, the cardinality of the rationals is less than the cardinality of the naturals. Because we're injective, but not surjective to the naturals. But we've already proved here that the naturals, there's a natural bijection from the naturals to the, excuse me, from the naturals to the rationals. So you compose these two, and you could that they only they could only be the same size. The reason I'm doing this is because I want you to get good at quickly seeing cardinality of sets, right? This was another quick argument that the naturals are, um, excuse me, the rationals are countably infinite, but e this one is the iconic one, right? That's the important one. For the same reason, just to be quick about it, uh, why is the naturals uh, countable, countably infinite? The Cartesian product. Can you do the same thing that you did there? Exactly, yeah. So the Cartesian product of two countably infinite sets is going to be countably infinite because you can do the same doveta dovetailing trick. You can map that to like the rationals, and then that would also prove that. It is a little trick with the rationals because there's more descriptions of, of rationals than there are rationals. Two over two and one over one are the same thing, but they're not the same element here. Oh, okay. So there's a slight, slight mess you have to do. What you would do is you do the same dovetailing trick, but then you don't say skipping repeats. You have to include the repeats, and it doesn't matter. The same thing, it turns out. Um, so this is countably infinite for the same reasons that the naturals is countably infinite. What about... Uh, the Cartesian product. I'm three. Why? Can't you just add like a, another prime number at the end? So it could be like two to the That would work. You could do arbitrarily long prime numbers, yes. But there's an, there, in a geometric trick, is there another thing you could do? You could do like a three-dimensional version of this table. That would also work. But the way I like to think of it is we just proved, so there's actually three good, three good arguments there. Add, the, add, add a five here to have another prime number. Uh, do a three-dimensional table. Don't know what that would look like. I don't know how to, I know how to do diagonals. I don't know how to do maybe like a spiral at each level and then something like this. Um, here's the way I like to think of it. Well, this certainly is just what? Uh, 
associativity. This is countably infinite. We just proved it. Cartesian product of a countably infinite set and a countably infinite set is countably infinite. You take to prove this is countably infinite. You don't have to do a three D table. First, you do a two D table of just two of them. Take that ordering and then put that as one of the axi, and then put the other one as the other axi. And now you have a two D table where one is grown. One represents like the product squared, and now it's now it's cubic. In general, this works as well, right? So n to the k. These are all countably infinite. Cartesian products of, of countably infinite sets. Finally, many Cartesian products of countably infinite sets are countably infinite. Okay, um, real quick with like an allegory, uh, have you guys heard of the story of the Hilberts Hotel? Maybe. Is this the one with like the rooms and stuff? Yes. So imagine you have a hotel that's infinitely large. Uh, I should draw the fourth one, right? Uh, there's the door. Um, so you have an infinitely large hotel, and it's full. Um, uh, I don't remember where, this, where Hilbert told the story. It might have been at like, a retirement address or something. But he was explaining how weird this infinite stuff is. So like, you have an you have a infinite, countably infinite-sized hotel. Okay? It's an infinitely tall hotel. Each room is full. Uh, one guy comes up, and he wants, to, uh, he wants to stay in the hotel. Even though the hotel is full, they can still make room for him. Why? Uh, the first guy in the everyone moves rooms. The first guy in the first room is going to move to the second room. Second guy in the uh, second guy is going to move to the third room. Third guy is going to move to the fourth room, and so on. And suddenly they have a open. The first room is now open, so the guy can stay in the hotel. So even though the hotel was full, they were able to make space. Uh, now, uh, what happens if a bus comes? which is countably infinite long. So a bus comes, and it's got countably infinite new guests in the room. Uh, the ho even though the hotel is full, uh, the, staff, the staff says no problem. Infinitely many people just came to the hotel, which already has infinitely many people, and it's full. They are able to make room. How? I, oh, is it like the first guy? Is the second guy moves to like the third room, and then they add him to the second room. And you tell each person to go to the two times the room number, and then you have countably yes. infinite. Yes, it's a you, if you uh, think of the proof we did that the evens were were uh, countably infinite. Each guy goes to the room multiplied by two, and then all the odd rooms are empty. Countably infinitely many odd rooms. That's enough space for the guests. Uh, kind of hidden in the, in the story here is the fact that the guests are having to do a lot of work. Okay? To fit one guy, you have to make countably infinitely many guests move rooms. They all move one room. That's crazy. Um, now you have to make the guys move a lot. So like, imagine you're room 1,000, and you have to room to room 2,000. You can assume it's 2,000 rooms away. You're going to be doing a lot of walking to get to room 2,000. Um, so you're making everyone do a lot of work for you to, to, to do this. And to conclude the story, uh, what if countably infinitely many buses come? Okay. So each bus has countably infinitely many people. However, there are countably now infinitely many buses. Uh, this one actually is slightly involved, and the story is slightly complicated. So I'm just going to leave this part as an exercise. I want you to think about it. I claim if countably infinitely many buses still come, then each with countably infinitely many people, you can still accommodate everyone. Okay, so I want to give you some ways to prove uh, accountability.
Um, so uh, the union of countable sets is countable. I'm going to do two proofs uh, right here, and I'm going to be kind of um, unrigorous, but I think the intuition should fill in the gaps. So let A, a uh, B, B countable. So it will even say countably infinite. Um, then there exists bijections. Um, F goes from A to the naturals, and G uh, goes from B to the naturals, a bijective. So there exist two. Oh, there exist two bijections. Uh, if, if if we assume A and B are countably infinite, then there exist bijections from those sets to the naturals. Um, I claim the following is a bijection for A union B. H of X is equal to uh, two F of X if X is in A, and two. 2g of x plus 1 if x is in b. I claim that h uh, takes a union b uh, to the naturals uh, bijectively. Now, uh, you've got to be careful because what if it's, it's not obvious what happens through this quote-unquote bijection if a and b are not in the intersection. But certainly it's true that, like, uh, a union B, the, side, the cardinality of A union B is strictly less than the cardinality of A plus B, right? So whatever the, if we assume that they're disjoint, we actually prove something slightly stronger, that something slightly bigger is countably infinite. So it's okay that we can wave our hands and say that the smaller thing is still countably infinite, right? So the union, this is one way you could show that the union of countably infinite sets, of two countably infinite sets is countably infinite, and for, from then on now you can just assume it. The union of two countable sets is countable. Okay, what about a countable union? What about a countable union of countable sets? Uh, this is countable. By countable union, we mean the union uh, is indexed over um, a countable set. So and it's, you've never probably ever seen an uncountable union, but they technically do exist. Uh, we'll talk about uncountability in the next lecture, actually, in, after the break. But basically, like, uh, if you did union of x in the real numbers of each, something like this. So here we're indexing over, we'll prove later that the reals are what's called uncountable that there are infinitely more reals than naturals, and the, the reals are not countable. Um, if you index this way, the union, what is this? Each set is a singleton. So each set is countably infinite. It's finite, even. Excuse me, it's countable. So we have an uncountable union of countable sets. What is this equal to? Yeah, it's just, just you take each part out and then glue it back in, and you end up with the same set, right? Obviously, that's true for any set. So that's going to just be the real numbers, and it turns out the reals are uncountable. We'll have to prove that later. So you by countably, countably, it, by countable union, we mean that this thing has to be countable. Okay. Proof, of course. I'm also going to wave my hands through it. Uh, let S1, S2 be a countable. Let each be uh, countable and indexed by countable set A. So what that means is like uh, we're going to compute the union of SI uh, for I is in A, where SI, each SI is countable and A is countable. So now we have an infinite union, but indexed in a countable way, in a discrete way, where you can say this is the first, this is the second, this is the third, and so on. You can even assume that each SI is the naturals, um, and A is the naturals or something, right? Um, now, I claim, we're, we want to compute the cardinality of this and show that it's, it's countable. 
Um, I claim that you can reorder the elements in this union into a table where the table has dimension A one way and the max of the SI the other way. So we can assume that the max of the SI is just the naturals and we can assume that the uh, other direction is indexed by A. So I claim, sort of unrigorously, that this has less cardinality than the Cartesian product of the naturals times A. Reorganize the elements here into a table. Each SI, in the worst case, has cardinality of the naturals because each one is uh, countably infinite, and they're indexed by a countably infinite set, but in a way that's distinct. Right? So if we, if we just put naturals here, we would take the countably infinite union of the same set. So suppose each naturals is distinct. Right. So we get, I claim that this is A times the number of naturals. Okay? A, though, is countably infinite. So A has cardinality of the naturals. We prove that the Cartesian product of countably infinite sets is countable. Right? QED. Countable union of countable sets is, in fact, uh, countable. Okay, uh, I have one more problem I want to do. It's one, it used to be a homework problem, but I'm going to give you three solutions to the same problem. So I claim, um, I want us to prove that the set of terminating natural se uh, sequences greater than one is countable. So this uh, uh, finite sequences of any length from um, the natural is greater than or equal to one. I'm doing greater than or equal to one to avoid a division by zero error, of course. So uh, this contains elements like one or one one or seven two three and so on, right? So those are some examples of elements in there, and I claim that this set is countable. Why is this? There's three proofs we can do, um, but I'm uh, I've seen maybe ten actually, like on homework and stuff. So I'm going to give you three three different proofs. Uh, first is like a let AI be sequences uh, sum to I. Right, so AI is the, is the sum of sequences which sum to I. Every sequence sums to only one thing, so every sequence is in, only in one AI. And every element sums to something. Countable union of countable sets is countable. Okay? That's the first way. Here's the second way. Um, consider the function like A goes to... A1, A2, say AK. It maps this to 2 to the A1, 3 to the A2, um, which we can write as the product of PI, I equals 1 to K to the AI, where PI is the ith prime and AI is the ith number in the sequence. Right. Why is this injective? Are 
So I'm asking, the, that is true, but I'm asking in, injective means that no two elements map to the same thing. Oh, is it because they all have different factors? Yes. There's a name for that, though. Their prime factorizations are different. I don't remember the name of the theorem. I think it's, huh? I don't think so. There is a name of the theorem. It's either the fundamental theorem of arithmetic or the fundamental theorem of algebra. Every integer has a unique prime factorization. The fact, because of the fact that prime factorization is unique, this, if two numbers map to the same, if two sequences map to the same number, they could have only been the same sequence because they have the same prime factorization, right? So I forget if, I think that's called the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. So by the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, this is uh, injective uh, to the set of natural numbers and therefore is countable. Yeah, I don't think it's the fundamental theorem of algebra. I think that's something else. Every finite abelian cyclic group is a decomposed into something like this. I don't remember. I think the arithmetic one is that, that makes more sense, right? Uh, F is injective to uh, naturals. If it takes on a sequence and uh, outputs number. Okay. So certainly it maps the image of f here. Right. So subsets of countable sets are countable. Um, there's a third way I want to enumerate. How did you know? So you look and look at two sequences. Um, let's say, I don't know, 2 comma 3. And let's say, I don't know, 1 comma 1 comma 2. I write these on the board, and these are two different sequences. Why are they different? Pretend you're 5. The numbers are different. The numbers are different. And like in a different order. They're in a different order. OK. Um, pretend you're 4. Pretend you're 4 years old. I'm that that would be like an eight year old answer. I'm fishing for like a ridiculous conclusion here, so I, it might be beyond. It might be. Wait, can you repeat the question? Why are these two sequences different? Two to three and one. They have different numbers in them. That's a five year old answer. I'm looking for the four year old answer. They don't match. They look different. Ah, oh, damn. Okay. So what's our, by, what's, our, what's, our, what's our function map here? I'm going to take the function that takes maps A and maps it to the string A. I'm going to take the two-string function, OK? This function maps um, every, every uh, sequence uniquely to a subset of sigma star. Subsets of countable sets are countable, but why is sigma star countable? That one's actually slightly tricky. It's not. It seems countable because you can order them lexicographically, but like, what would be a better argument? You need to like convert you like cast an integer, and then you have natural numbers. Uh, natural leading numbers zeros. Time. There's a trouble. There's a trick there with leading zeros. That would almost work though. The the a quick way to do it is that sigma star is of course what. It's a it's a countable union of countable sets. Not only a countable unit of countable sets, but a finite sets. Right? Each sigma i is the strings of length i. So you take a countable union of finite sets. Certainly, sigma star is therefore countable. You can also, outside of this one lecture, you could just say, obviously, lexicographically ordered them. You can iterate over it lexicographically. Forgetting the leading zeros and the casting part, that, that's, that gets around that. There is an ith string, certainly, lexicographically. Um, so just by taking the two string function, uh, we were able to show that we were able to show that it's injective into a subset of it's to a set of strings. So therefore, because it's a subset of a countable set, it has to be countable. But this really didn't have anything to do with the fact that we were looking at sequences. This is this actually works for a lot of things, it turns out. This proof to prove countability, where you just look at it as a string. 
And this is actually called the typewriter principle. And it is probably the most useful tool ever to show that a set is countable. I wish it was shown more. Like, it's so easy. Uh, you do this one quick proof, and then you get to apply this uh, forever. And then you, can, you can't actually, the one set you can't use to show is countable with a typewriter principle is sigma star itself, because that would be recursive. You need to, that would be circular, excuse me. You need to assume sigma star is countable uh, to prove this fact. So what's the, what's the typewriter principle? Let's say TP. Uh, if elements uh, like A of some set S can be a uniquely uh, described by finite uh, terminating strings, all strings terminate, uh, except for the lecture we're going to do after this. We're going to talk about infinite strings. But suppose the strings have all finite length. Uh, terminating uh, strings, S is countable. Okay. So if the elements of a set can be uniquely described by strings, uh, then the set is countably infinite. It's set countable. So proof, uh, let uh, F be that. Uh, two string function so what we're going to do is going to map uh, f of a is going to output the string representation of a since each element has a unique string um, F is injective. Uh, it probably is not surjective, because it doesn't say that every string has to have something that maps to it. But it certainly is injective, but perhaps not surjective. So perhaps something looks like this, right? It's certainly injective, but perhaps not surjective. Um, since it's injective, uh, F is certainly bijective to its own image. So a but um, the image is a subset of sigma star. And subsets of countable sets are countable. So you're injective into a countable set. You are bijective to your own image. And your image is a subset of a countable set. Therefore, you could only, you could only have been a countable set to begin with. QED, S is countable. OK, let's take our little break.